and then I'll be giving my talk on uh, thyroid and Dr. Pro will give his both talks at the end. Thank you. I'll try to be as quick as I can on orbital, idiopathic orbital inflammation, which is quite a large topic. Orbital inflammation, you heard a lot this afternoon and the early, later part of the morning on specific and non-specific. I'm going to concentrate mainly on non-specific inflammations. It used to be called pseudotumor mainly because when you did a, a scan or, or x-ray, you could see a lesion in the orbit, but when you biopsied it, it wasn't a tumor. So that's why the term pseudotumor was used. But obviously not anymore. It's called idiopathic orbital inflammation. Our role has changed completely from uh, diagnosing inflammation to ruling out serious underlying disease like lymphomas. And what you need to understand is any orbital pathology, let it be uh, lymphoma, let it be other tumors, can present as idiopathic orbital inflammation. Any systemic disease, say they have a small prostate carcinoma, uterine carcinoma, breast carcinoma, lung carcinoma, carcinoma of the bowels can present as idiopathic inflammation in the orbit. So this is a sort of paraneoplastic reaction in the orbit. So you do a biopsy in the orbit, it comes back as idiopathic inflammation, but be sure that you do investigate the patient thoroughly to rule out underlying carcinomas. So any systemic carcinoma without it being a secondary in the orbit can present as an inflammation in the orbit. There are various types, could be acute or chronic, and histopathology is classic, and it's usually, you can divide it based on the location in the orbit, it could be anterior, it could be muscle involvement, myocytes, could be lacrimal gland involvement, dacryoadenitis, could be diffuse in the orbit, or could be epical in the posterior orbit. The common features are usually hallmarks of infl inflammation, and when you do a biopsy, it shows all forms of it. Here, you can see the typical features of a dacryoadenitis. There is redness, inflammation, there will be warmth in the orbit, and you can see conjunctival condition, and there's lacrimal gland enlargement. This is a subacute presentation of a dacryoadenitis. You can get confused with myositis. Obviously, thyroid disease involves multiple muscles. It is uh, asymmetric. You could confuse it with lymphoma. I'll talk to you a couple of things about that. You can confuse it with arteriovenous fistulas. Metastasis in the muscle is not unusual. So, single muscle involvement is typical of myositis, whereas in thyroid eye disease, there will be multiple asymmetric involvement of multiple muscles, and inflammation extends to the tendon, whereas thyroid doesn't. Another important early clinic sign, very useful clinical sign, in thyroid eye disease, if the muscle is involved, the eye movement is restricted opposite to the muscle involvement. Whereas in myositis, the muscle is sort of paralyzed. So if the medial rectus is involved in myositis, the patient cannot duct. Whereas if the medial rectus is involved in thyroid eye disease, the patient cannot duct. It's opposite to the muscle involvement in thyroid and in the direction of the muscle in myositis. That's a useful clinical sign in early diagnosis. So here is the patient with myositis of the left medial rectus. So she can't adduct or adapt, whereas she can abduct. So this is arteriovenous fistula, presenting like this if you think of orbital inflammation, but a scan picks up very clearly a large superior ophthalmic vein. That is a giveaway. Thyroid eye disease, as I mentioned, direction of restriction, and more importantly, they can also have Thyroid eye disease do not have ptosis but a lid lag or red retraction, whereas in inflammation there will be ptosis. So differential diagnosis of diffuse it could be cellulitis, could be hemorrhage into pre existing lesion, could be scleritis, could be collagen vascular disease, which we all looked into. Dacryoadenitis could be due to viral or bacterial, but remember any malignancy can present as, present as dacryoadenitis. So here is a patient with typical features of bacteriolinitis. Investigations. Normally we do a CT scan on the first port of call, MRI if necessary. We rarely do ultrasound for orbital diagnosis. Baseline blood tests are done. You might have heard about IgG4, which has come up within the last 3-4 years. 
which causes more osteosing type of orbital inflammation. And you should look for specific markers, vagueness, pontiform goal for the tuberculosis in specific situations, BDR. And as I mentioned, systemic workup in all patients who are diagnosed with orbital inflammation. The MRI or CT findings are typical. And here is a patient with dactyloidinitis involving the uh, lacrimal gland. Here is an interesting patient who initially thought was ITG4, but he ended up having a secondary sweat gland carcinoma in the orbit. Initial biopsy was uh, ITG4, later extensive biopsy showed secondary uh, carcinoma of the sweat gland. Fortunately, he is still here, he is having acceleration and uh, radiotherapy is more than 7 years. Here is a patient with dactyloidinitis with ptosis. When should you biopsy in a case of idiopathic inflammation? You should ask yourself when you shouldn't biopsy. That's how you should approach it. Single muscle involvement, we wouldn't biopsy. Diffuse anterior involvement, we wouldn't biopsy. Sclerotis type picture, obviously you wouldn't biopsy. When it's apical involvement, because the biopsy can be uh, cause more morbidity than, than treating it empirically, again, you wouldn't biopsy at the initial phase at least. Definite biopsy when it's atypical, when there is lacrimal gland involvement, scan shows localized lesion, and if it's apical and doesn't respond to your usual treatment, or it responds to treatment and then comes back again within three months, you would biopsy it. And keep repeating the biopsy if in doubt. Why should you not get confused? Lymphoma can easily be confused with orbital inflammation. I just missed past these slides. This, as you can see, lymphoma can present as anything. Orbital inflammation can present as anything. Again, investigations are similar. Again, only thing is, it's not diffuse, can mold around orbital structures, lymphoma, bony erosion is unlikely. Obviously, when there's confusion between the two, which is very common, there's no point doing a needle biopsy, a proper tissue biopsy. Conventional histology, immunohistochemistry, ISH, and then you should subject the specimens to molecular genetics, which we do routinely now. Molecular genetics was a technique developed in our University Leicester uh, well before I, I became an ophthalmologist and uh, Alec Jeffries is still active in the lab, he got a uh, Nobel Prize for it in 1984. That's the technology used for uh, DNA fingerprinting criminals etc. That technology is still, uh, Leicester University gets a lot of money from royalty. So that technology used for the early lymphoma analysis of the DNA. And clinical suspicion needs to be high, biopsies are featured, good communication with the pathologist, close follow-up of patients with negative results. And even if the biopsy doesn't show features of lymphoma, but clinically and radiologically you're convinced it's lymphoma, we send the patients to staging, occasionally we pick up lymphoma from the bone marrow or other parts of the body. So here is a patient who in all intents and purposes Presented as inflammation, but if he had a mass, it turned out to be lymphoma. Here is a patient with bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement. Here is an interesting chap presented as so called uh, subacute orbital idiopathic inflammation. The original diagnosis was of thyroid eye disease based on the scans, but typical features thyroid eye disease, you have inferior rectus, but not lateral rectus and superior rectus involvement first. It will be inferior rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus, lateral rectus. So if you see lateral rectus involvement first, before any other muscle, it is not thyroid unless proven otherwise. He had a biopsy based on his findings and we found very aggressive lymphoma. Unfortunately, he died within six months of the diagnosis. Here is a patient with lymphoma. Here is another patient you would think this is orbital abscess, but no, this was a lymphoma with acute presentation. Here is a patient with TB lacrimal gland. This was a patient with vagueness. Any patient with immunosuppression, as Senator spoke about, can present as a lacrimal gland. He had bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement, a condition called post tumor lymphoproliferative uh, disease, which is like a lymphoma. Here is another patient presented as lacrimal gland enlargement, turned out to be lymphoma. Here is a bilateral, you would think this is idiopathic orbital inflammation. But this turned out to be an aggressive lymphoma. I will finish with this just to emphasize that idiopathic orbital inflammation 
can any disease in the body can present as idiopathic inflammation. Any disease in the orbit can present as idiopathic inflammation. Once you've done the biopsy, under diagnosis is idiopathic inflammation. Please do follow up the patients for in long term. Repeat of the biopsy as many times as necessary. Do not treat the patients with steroids empirically. If they do not behave the way you want you, you expect them to behave, please investigate them thoroughly because any serious underlying disease can present as idiopathic inflammation in the orbit. Thank you.